program featuring SOMA. Um, next slide, please. Um, this year's forum is funded and sponsored by the Tri-County Regional Energy Network, Bay Ren, and SoCal Ren. We'd also like to thank our additional sponsors, Terra Verde Energy, the Energy Coalition, and TRC companies for supporting the planning efforts for this forum. Next slide. We'd further like to give a huge, huge thank you to our promo partners who have helped tremendously with outreach. Their efforts are instrumental in ensuring SEEK resources are shared with a diverse audience so that more local governments can learn and hear from one another. Next slide. Just to go over some quick housekeeping, please be sure to keep yourself muted and use the raise hand feature if you want to unmute. We will be tracking your questions through the chat box, but also encourage you to use the chat box to introduce yourself, engage with other participants, or reach out to SEEK staff, which would be myself and Serena Soar, about any tech issues you may have. Next slide. Now I'd like to pass it on to our moderator for this webinar, who is Kaja Hendrickson, who is a project manager at SOMA. Thanks for joining us, Kaja. I believe you are muted. <laughs> It wouldn't be a, a Zoom event if someone hadn't been muted. Uh, so thank you for the introduction and thanks for everyone for having us here today. We're excited to be with you all. As mentioned, my name is Kaisa Hendrickson and I am currently on Eastern Shoshone and Goshoot land. And I will turn over to Sarah and Stacy to introduce. Hey everyone, I'm Stacy Hoyle, the Workforce Development Manager. I go by she, her pronouns. Um, and I'm currently visiting my family in coastal North Carolina on the land of the Cape Fear native people. Um, but normally I'm in the Bay Area on Muwek Ma'oloni tribe land. And Sada? Hi everyone, my name is Sada Salem, she, her, her pronouns. I'm the Senior Tenant Service and Community-Based Organization manager for the SOMA program. I'm on unceded Cherokee and Muscogee land here in Atlanta, Georgia, and really excited to speak to you all about how to build equity into your programs and your policy work. Great, thank you, Sada and Stacy. And we'd like to invite all of you to put your name, title, tribal lands into the chat at any point in time, since we won't have an opportunity to do formal intern or um, introductions. And we would love to also see what you came for. So please feel free to put into the chat what you're hoping to get out of today's session. And this helps us understand what everyone's expecting and hoping for. So with that, we'd like to kick it off um, and see what some of you know about SOMA and see how familiar you are. So if everyone will take a quick moment to fill out this poll about how familiar you are with the SOMA program. All right, great. So you can all see a little bit. So we have a few of you who are familiar with SOMA and a lot of you who are not familiar. So with that in mind, let's kick it off into what we're going to be talking about. So we're really excited to share about SOMA with everyone. And we're going to give you a quick overview about the program today and then really dive into three core components of the SOMA program. It's workforce development, it's tenant education, and it's community-based organization partnerships. So that ideally you can walk away understanding the advocacy work of groups that contributed to someone's existence, understanding the makeup of the communities that we serve and the responsibilities we have to them, understanding our job training, tenant education, and community-based partnerships and how they contribute to and help the program be equitable, 
and uh, be able to identify if there are any opportunities for you to partner with SOMA and bring the program's benefits to your community. And we'll have time to answer questions in between each of those three sections, so please feel free to put questions into the chat as they come up. So first, we'd like to talk a little bit about what SOMA is. And so SOMA is, is a pioneering program. It's kind of the first of its kind that takes a very holistic look at economic environment and community change through solar. So going so much more than, than just solar installation. And SOMA is an incentive program that was designed to help close the gap between who has access to solar and benefits from solar as well as those who are traditionally unavailable or unable to access it, which primarily is low-income households and especially multifamily households tend to be very underrepresented in solar access. So the program was designed to install 300 megawatts of solar by 2030, so we have a really ambitious goal, throughout the entire state of California and to create mutual benefit for property owners and tenants while increasing energy efficient and offsetting carbon emissions. The program is funded through cap and trade via the California Public Utilities Commission uh, to benefit the most climate impacted people in the state. And 90% of the program's budget goes towards the program incentives. And the program is up to 100 million per year for 10 years, so close to a billion dollars over the course of the 10 year life of the program. Now here you'll see the where the program works. So we work with five major utilities across the entire state, including CCAs that are participating with those utilities. So Pacific or Pacific Gas and Electric, Liberty Utility, Southern California Edison, and San Diego Gas and Electric. Now, so SOMA was created through a, a coalition, particularly with the leadership of assembly member, Susan Eggman, representing Stockton and the Western portions of San Joaquin County in collaboration with nonprofits, environmental justice organizations, and stakeholders from the private sector who worked together to help pass AB 693 back in 2015. And this actually, this coalition included some of the community-based organization partners that we currently have today, and that SADA will be talking about a little bit more later. So after that, the California Public Utilities Commission issued decision D1712022 in 2017, which ultimately led to the creation of SOMA as we know it today. The original legislation in the final CPUC decision set SOMA's intention of providing that financial relief to low-income tenants through direct energy bill credits and stimulating economic development. Now in this program design, which is why we're, we're here to talk today, that's where our equity is built in. And we have a handbook that set really clear guidelines on the goals of the legislation, including tenant protection language and tenant allocation requirements to help make sure that the program is actually executing the equity that it was designed to, to carry out. Now, in terms of how the program reaches the populations across California, how we determine that, that's determined by two key factors, one being low, low income areas and the other being areas determined to be disadvantaged communities. And I use that term to reference the formal definition from Cal EnviroScreen, which references um, uh, the, or which provides scores that represent a combined measure of the pollution and potential vulnerability of a population in California. And this um, includes 20 different indicators which are divided into pollution burden and population characteristics. And I'd like to note that with that, when we're referring to environmental justice communities, that can include individuals in DACs or communities in, in DACs. But when we're referring to DACs, we are referring to just those communities that fall into the top 25% considered most vulnerable in California. It also should be noted that the indicators within the population characteristics have been impacted substantially by COVID-19 and by wildfires. And so SOMA particularly focuses on how to reach the, this, this population of DACs throughout the state. And you can see on here the map of where these disadvantaged communities are. So these are the ones that again have the highest pollution um, impact and environmental and, and climate impacts. And you can see that a lot of that is in the Central Valley and then Southeastern California. Um, and so there are multiple pollution sources that disproportionately concentrate in low income communities with high minority populations. And then there are also socioeconomic stressors that are associated with increased uh, sensitivity to pollution. So all of those play a role in the populations that we really want to get solar installed onto. So SOMA was designed for meeting these, these, um, these goals with five key criteria for properties. So one is that the properties have to be at least five, five units. 
Two is that they have to be deed restricted low income residential housing. So that's making sure that anyone who applies for the sum of funding, it has to be low income housing. Um, it needs to be existing buildings because SOMA is not trying to address the new coming buildings. It's trying to address the gaps that have existed over the last 20 years of incentive programming where multifamily just hasn't been um, focused on. Uh, it also requires virtual net metering so that each individual tenant actually gets financial benefits. And it has to either be located in one of these disadvantaged communities or have 80% of the property residents have incomes at or below 60% of the area median income. So to look at the policy before we move on to Sada and Stacy, here's the core pillars that kind of make up SOMA's equity approach. And we have it broken down into six different areas that you can see that are woven into the fabric of the program, how we implement the program, how it's executed uh, to make sure that equity and environmental justice are, are in everything that we do. So the first is a programmatic focus, which is that the SOMA program has an advisory council, which is comprised of contractors, affordable housing uh, um, uh, agencies, environmental justice and labor advocates, as well as consumer and tenant advocates, as well as public forums that we use to ensure that community voices and stakeholders are heard in understanding the program, but also in giving us feedback on how the program is working and if it's meeting the needs that it's supposed to. Second one is consumer protection. So the program really built in strongly to have the elements that take consumer protection very seriously, including requiring active licenses for all contractors. We do track all contractors that come into the program and that are able to even apply for the incentive or work with the property, um, as well as tenant benefits affidavits that Sarah will be talking about more. Our next one is offering a no cost technical assistance, which is one of the bigger areas of, of equity that we provide so that properties who may not have the staff or may be nonprofit properties and um, don't have the capacity to work on an incentive program. This technical assistance provides um, customized reports estimating the property's solar uh, potential incentive and cost analysis, as well as build credits and things like that, providing all of that lined out and supporting property owners, particularly through understanding working with contractors, getting bids from contractors. Um, and we even have a, a bidding tool on our website that helps property owners through all of this for free. The next one is our workforce development, which includes robust job training um, requirements and initiatives, which Stacy will dive into in a little bit. And then this also includes some additional oversight boards that look over our workforce development that helps make sure that we're again executing the program the way that we we intended it to and then soma of course is the first program of its kind to require property owners to facilitate tenant education um, which again we'll be talking about further but that is our way of ensuring that property owners and tenants have the solar being something that they're a part of instead of something that's happening to them and then some of our last unique features of the program are that we use a community-based data-driven approach to our marketing education and outreach we partner with these community-based organizations and have a feedback loop where community-based organizations help do marketing education outreach for us and then feedback to us where and how things are working or not working in the program. So based on our current application queue, here's where, where we're just projected at and the program is just barely over two years old. So we already have 59.83 megawatts reserved with over 400 applications and 290 million in incentive funding available right now across the state. In terms of our long-term projections, um, the, we anticipate that the program could impact up to 3,500 properties, 250,000 households, and create job training opportunities for up to 3,000 job trainees. So now that you know the basics of SOMA, I'm gonna hand it over to Stacy to talk about workforce development. Thanks, Kaisa. So um, as you just saw with the statistics Kaisa showed, this program has an incredible focus on job training. Um, as many other similar incentive programs in California do, workforce development and job training is a huge um, part of this program and how we are building equity into this program. Um, so because of programs like SOMA, other clean energy policies we're seeing and the general growth of the solar industry, skilled workers are really needed for these new jobs being created. And SOMA is working to expand where these solar jobs are and who's getting access to them. 
Um, so the program has a job training requirement built into every project that requires the participating contractor to hire and pay one to two solar job trainees for each project. And then this number of trainees and the number of hours that they work is dependent on the size of the system being installed. Um, so trainees are gonna get on the job experience working on these projects and they can participate in a installation role. Um, they can work on project design and engineering site assessment, and they can also work in a post installation role like commissioning and um, the maintenance of the system. And so SOMA uh, focuses on quality over quantity. So um, where previous programs have required maybe more trainees for shorter hours, SOMA is really focused on making sure that one to two trainees are getting a full scope or full spectrum experience on, a, on these multifamily installation projects. So they are short-term project-based opportunities. Most of these um, jobs are about one to two weeks. Sometimes the trainees are kept on for several months to complete the project. But what we're hearing from our trainees and our, our contractors is that um, the contractors are hiring on these trainees for longer term opportunities after these projects. So that's exactly what we want to see. All right, next slide, Kaisa, please. All right, so we are, SOMA is also working to expand access to solar jobs. So one of the ways we do this is by um, creating specific criteria in who is eligible for these job training opportunities. So students and trainees from job training organizations and partners um, who we work with across the state, we have about 80 job training organizations we um, have verified right now, and we're always continuing to seek new partners. Um, so students and trainees from those programs um, are eligible and those are usually uh, solar installation programs, trade technical schools, community colleges. We work with some nonprofits. Um, and we also allow tenants of the property where the so uh, SOMA is being installed to participate in these opportunities as well. So SOMA has a target or goal that 50% of these eligible trainees are either a local hire or a targeted hire. And so for SOMA's definition, a local hire is someone who lives in the same county as where the project is being installed. And a targeted hire are um, you know, residents of our affordable house of housing properties, women, people of color, um, justice, people who have been impacted by the justice system and others facing barriers to employment. And um, so we are working to achieve this goal by intentionally partnering with those job training programs that specifically serve these communities. So for example, um, East LA Skill Center partners with Homeboy Industries down in LA to offer folks who have been impacted um, by the justice system or formerly incarcerated uh, solar PV, a whole 12 week solar PV training program. Um, and in Oakland, California, Rising Sun Center for Opportunity is one uh, partner we work with that has an all women pre-apprenticeship training cohort um, and, and those are just a couple of the, the job training programs we work with that serve these communities. Um, but the SOMA program administration team is working to build the pipeline of eligible job trainees who are ready to work. And we're also supporting contractors in identifying and hiring and recruiting job trainees. Next slide. Thanks, Kaisa. Um, so anyone who works in workforce development knows that this is much more it's, it's about much more than just creating jobs. So SOMA is dedicated to um, you know, the creation of these opportunities, but also building the pipeline of diverse job seekers, ensuring that those job seekers have the skills and supportive resources they need to access these opportunities. So a lot of times we see transportation barriers, they can find childcare, um, language barriers. And so we are working with local resource partners um, to try to help trainees overcome these barriers and really access these opportunities. And we're also working with the employers to create equitable pay, safe workplaces, safe job sites, um, and you know, where, where employees from all backgrounds can, can feel safe on the job site. And we're also working with employers to create and make sure there are opportunities for career growth as well. Um, so SOMA, one way we're doing this is through a SOMA wage floor. So SOMA ensures that trainees are paid wages that are consistent with industry standards for entry-level positions. So um, that is 1.4 times the local minimum wage. So that's what contractors have to pay 
um, job trainees, and that gets it to about a comparable wage to um, solar industry entry level standards. And we also have workshops for contractors upcoming later this year. We're going to have a fair chance hiring workshop for solar employers and contractors. It's really open to anyone who wants to um, attend. So look out on our SOMA events page for that. And we also have a job training organization task force. And this is to make sure that we're keeping the voices of our job training partners and their students and trainees and their local communities at the forefront of this program. So that task force is made up of nine members representing job training organizations across the state. Um, and they meet quarterly to make sure that this program is addressing opportunity accessibility, um, it, how, to, how the program can successfully engage with job training organizations and partners and how to make these short-term opportunities part of a long-term career advancement plan for these individuals we're serving. And we also have career development resources and workshops for our job seekers or job trainees. We've had a resume workshop, interview workshop, um, and we're hopefully putting on a negotiation workshop soon too. Um, so any, those are also open events and we have them usually recorded on our SOMO webpage. Um, yeah, and then one of the other workshops we're putting on is a Know Your Rights workshop for job seekers and trainees so that they're aware of their employment rights and um, you know, how to report anything if anything goes wrong uh, with their employer or on the job site. And I think that's the end of my slides, Kaisa. Um, were we gonna pause and see if there were any questions or if anyone wanted to take themselves off mute and ask a clarifying question? Yes, I think so. And unfortunately, I cannot see the chat because of my screen sharing, but Sada and Stacy, if you will check. And then likewise, if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself to ask. It doesn't look like we have any chatted questions, but just so everyone knows, we're gonna try to get into some breakout rooms later. So smaller groups, you'll be paired up with myself, Kaisa or Sada. Um, and you can ask any questions then too. All right, and I'll get us out of then. Awesome, thank you, Stacy and Kaisa. Um, as mentioned, my name is Sada. I am the tenant service and CBO senior manager. So we're gonna start with tenant education. Next slide. So before we get started, this is a little bit of a chance for y'all to interact with us. I wanted to ask you all, why do you think tenant education matters? Feel free to chat it in the box. Give you all a couple seconds. Take yourself off mute. Um, but why would why would a program like SOMA make tenant education part of uh, as a as a requirement? Any ideas? Don't be shy. Or be shy. It's fine. It's lunchtime. Give you all a few more seconds. No ideas. All right. We'll go to the next slide. Try the next slide. Awesome. So for at the SOMA program, we have a few reasons why tenant education um, matters. And it's honestly not limited to what's listed on this uh, slide, but it's ensure tenant and installer safety on site. So as you know, when you have uh, something new happening at your building, you're really engaged and want to know why something is happening. And it's really important that tenants are aware of why equipment's on site, any discomfort they might have. Um, also to reduce tenant confusion and discomfort. So uh, parking spots might be taken up. There'll be new people on site. So it's really important to make sure tenants are feeling safe and secure with what's happening at their building. This is their home. And so it's really important that we put um, a requirement on the program that we have tenants educated. Addition, additionally, allows us to center tenant voices, and we do that through um, having tenant education be part of the program, but also through our CBO partnerships. Inform tenants of the SOMA benefits. So as Stacy has noted, there's the job training opportunity, but there's also the bill savings from having solar. Um, create awareness of changes associated with SOMA. So billing will change when tenants get SOMA. So they go from um, a regular bill to a VNEM bill, and that looks different. And also they have more tier or more rate options. So they can go from a tiered rate system to a time of use system. And so we want tenants to be aware of those options and which one will work best. And lastly, of course, is taking advantage of the job training opportunity. It is really rare to have in a program that just because you live in a SOMA pro, uh, property, you can take advantage and 
be part of a solar, um, the solar career path. And so we really want tenants to take advantage of that um, and how better to engage people than with having them understand what's happening on their site and why solar matters and how it can contribute to their overall well-being. I do see in the chat, we got some answers. So that's awesome. I'm gonna read those. Yes, the help renders understand energy efficiency is a, is a great point. And that's actually part of our tenant education requirements. Um, and uh, to connect to the program, feeling a part of the solar program and not feeling like it's being done to them is a really important part of the program as well. So great answers. Thank you for adding those in. And just to emphasize, there's an abundance of reasons why tenant education matters. These are just some of the high level ones. Next slide. So in summary, we are mandated through the program, which is great to know that there is a mandate that is in the, the building blocks of this program to ensure participants, par, uh, participating SOMA tenants receive SOMA approved information on energy efficiency, time of use rate, if relevant, tiered rate, built um, interpretation, solar training opportunities, and resources for additional support and information. Um, the way this is required is tenants, uh, there's two requirements on the host customer. So that the host customer in this case is considered the property owner, and they are required to meet these two requirements 60 days or fewer prior to the start of construction. That's mostly because uh, we want there to be a relevance of this information for tenants. And so we don't want it to happen too far in advance where tenants aren't aware of what's happening. And we don't want it to happen too far from when it happened that it feels irrelevant. So we have the 60 day or fewer um, requirement. The two means of tenant education are one, they're required to receive all of the um, materials, required materials in print in a language they prefer. And the second is um, to have a workshop or some sort of second point of information, whether it's a walkthrough, explaining the materials they've gotten. And so those materials include what to expect um, with the SOMA program, what changes you'll see on your bill, and also the energy saving assistance program in their IOU territory information. Um, and these, these requirements, while they aren't super cumbersome on the property owner, they do help relieve a lot of the stress tenants will feel uh, from getting a new system at their household. Next slide. So how do we moderate this? We have two tenant affidavits. The one is the affidavit ensuring 100% tenant um, economic benefits. So this may have not been mentioned earlier, but tenants are to receive at least 51% uh, of the overall savings of the building has to be allocated to the tenants. This might sound deceiving in the way it's mentioned, but of all of the energy that is created for the building, 51% at least has to be uh, split up among the tenant units. We've found that in the program, most properties are actually doing somewhere around 80 to 90% allocation. So that, in, that ensures that with solar, all that tenants get benefits, but also that they're not um, being uh, penalized for getting solar at the building. So property owners can't increase rent, for example, for getting um, solar. The other is our affidavit ensuring tenant education. And this is the one that they sign uh, that says that they did do the tenant education and they met those two tenant education requirements. We also provide tenant education support. Uh, we work very hard on understanding how best to support tenants. We work with our CBOs. And so we wanna make it as easy and helpful towards our host customers and contractors as we can. So we provide a free service uh, that includes the tenant education services, which can be something as easy as having a phone call with one of our team members about how they can conduct their tenant education with a one-on-one -on -one meeting or a training, or we'll go and actually do the second tenant education requirement, such as the workshop for the property. All of this is done to make it as easy and supportive to the tenants, knowing that capacity is varying among contractors and property owners, and that this is not something to feel heavy about, but actually, contractors and property owners should be excited because this allows them to perhaps get a job trainee from the site or ensures that their tenants are comfortable and aware of all of their solar um, opportunities. Next slide. So we have a quick poll question. If it could launch. Um, so far, what component of the SOMA program are you interested in learning about more? And this will help us in our breakout groups.
Just waiting for a few more answers to roll in. Awesome. And also, please feel free to drop in questions in the chat as we go. Uh, we're keeping track of them and we'll answer them. All right, this is perfect. <laughs> Community-based organization partnerships, that's what we're getting into next. So awesome, so we have a bit of interest in tenant education, job training and technical assistance, but CBO partnerships, awesome. Well, let's dive in. All right, so community-based organization partnerships. This is an amazing component of our program and something we all are really excited to talk to you about. Um, so next slide. So what we're gonna talk about are who are our CBO partners, who do they serve, and what are their scopes of work? This very small image was obviously pre-COVID in one of our CBO summits. Uh, we do these quarterly, and uh, it's a great opportunity just to build really strong relationships with our CBO partners, get to know each other, talk about the program, work through scope. Um, and we were hoping to have one this fall, but uh, you know that pandemic is making us wait a little bit longer. Uh, next slide. So who are our CBO partners? We actually have six CBO partners. Uh, we have Self-Help Enterprises, Communities for a Better Environment, Environmental Health Coalition, California Environmental Justice Alliance, Asian Pacific Environmental Network, and Rising Sun. Uh, Rising Sun is the workforce development CBO, and they work primarily on Stacey's team supporting with our workforce work, but there is a lot of cross uh, scope work that happens between our five primary CBOs and Rising Sun. Next slide. So where are they located? Um, on the left, you can see where the community-based organizations that make up uh, the SOMA program are located. Uh, the areas where our CBOs organize also overlap with the areas the Cal, of the Envi Cal and Biosgreen 3.0. Uh, that highlights the disadvantaged communities within the state of Cal California. Um, these are the top 25 scoring areas, as Kaisa had alluded to, uh, that are most impacted by the intersection of environmental, economic, social, and health issues. Our CBOs are at the heart of the environmental justice movement um, and are addressing all issues um, within this space. Our CBO communities are extremely diverse because environmental justice is a very place-based movement. What is consistent across all of our CBO communities um, is that the communities have low income, um, are low income communities of color that are disproportionately impacted by high rates of asthma, uh, limited access to economic opportunities and growth, live near major polluting sources um, that cause issues with air quality, um, water drink, uh, water for them to drink, as well as soil for them to play in. In addition, our CBO communities have at least um, at, have the least access to clean energy technologies like solar, face more energy insecurity, and are more likely to face disconnection, pay a higher amount of their monthly income to their electricity bill, and live in affordable or multifamily housing. And so for that reason, as you can see on this map, our five CBOs are all located in our heavily burdened regions and are able to provide insight to the program of what communities are in need of. Um, well, next slide, I'll talk a little bit more about where they're each located, but something to note here is our partnerships. A lot of these CBOs helped create the SOMA program and have a huge impact on how the program is implemented. And I can't emphasize how important that's been, especially with the COVID pandemic coming through. They let us know what our communities are facing and allow us to make sure that we're pivoting and are responsive to those needs. Next slide. So our Asian Pacific Environmental Network, APEN, is located in Richmond and Oakland. Then Communities for a Better Environment support East Oakland, Richmond, Southeast LA, and Wilmington. Next slide. The Environmental Health Coalition supports National City, Barrio Logan, City Heights, and the San Diego region. And we also have CEHA, or the California Environmental Justice Alliance, who is our statewide representative, and support our um, gap areas. So as you can tell on the map, we don't have CBOs everywhere in the state. And so each year of contracting um, CEHA 
identifies an area where we don't have huge impact and focuses their energy on supporting that community. Um, in previous years, it was the Central Valley, um, and then it was the Inland Empire. And this year, we're hoping they're going to focus a little bit more um, in the San Bernardino region. Next slide. And then we just contracted, we're going into our second year with Self-Help Enterprises Community Development Space. And based on the SOMA opportunities, they're supporting Fresno, Kern, and Tulare. Uh, next slide. So what do our CBOs do? I'm talking about these great partnerships, but what do they do? How do we work with each other? So um, they support our marketing education outreach efforts. That means they focus on four primary audience types. They focus on community at large, uh, property owners and host customers, tenants, job trainees, and governmental agencies. The way that shows up is they run workshops or do one-on-one -on -one meetings um, with community members about SOMA, but also about environmental justice issues at large. We understand that SOMA doesn't benefit everyone. If you're not in a IOU territory that is, is part of the SOMA program, um, or you don't live in a property that is SOMA eligible, the program can't necessarily benefit you as much as, as it could if you did live in one of those areas. So when talking to community at large, our CBOs often talk about environmental justice issues and use an effort to talk about the holistic effort to get um, environmental justice issues uh, taken care of in their community. They support our property owner work by identifying um, multifamily affordable housing units that might not be in our database and also do outreach to these uh, properties to ensure that they know about the program and are encouraged to enroll. They support our tenants by one, helping us um, do tenant education and also tenant evaluations. Job trainees, is, they help in getting job trainees into the pipeline, teaching them about the SOMA opportunities. And also with governmental agencies, they are currently working to get in, in the room with governmental agencies, letting them know that there's this opportunity of SOMA and creating an overall understanding of the program. Um, they also do a lot of regulatory support for us. So that includes any handbook changes or programmatic changes we do in the SOMA program. Um, this includes when we were shifting to do um, uh, work around helping payment to contractors early on in the program due to the pandemic and the uh, financial strain. Our CBOs supported uh, letting us know what needed to be added to make sure things were equitable and fair. Um, and also they help with monitoring and evaluation process. That can show up in a lot of ways, whether there's um, players who aren't doing such a great job in the program and there's issues of um, you know, someone not necessarily following the rules properly, they give input on that um, and also are able to inform us when there's needs or gaps within the program. And in, 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 uh, in culmination, they provide a community voice. They're aware of what's happening on the ground, which we're not always aware of. Uh, we all live in different parts of the state or in the country. And if we're not keeping our eyes and ears on the ground, uh, we can't serve the communities properly and our CBOs ensure we do that. We have a highly collaborative relationship with our CBOs. So we're in our third year of contracts. And why that's so important to note is that these relationships take time. They take uh, often meeting with each other, uh, learning from each other, trusting each other. And what we found pretty early on is that one year contracts weren't enough. Uh, we couldn't learn about the communities enough and we couldn't share with each other enough in just one year. And then we had this uh, little pandemic come and throw us off a little bit. So we had to become inventive and creative about how do we reach our communities while also making sure we keep them safe and healthy. Uh, so next slide. I don't think we have a third poll question, do we? No, I don't think so. But I did want to open it up for questions before we go into our breakout groups. Any questions? All right, I think we're gonna go into our breakout groups um, and the things we're gonna focus on is what, what do equity focused parts of, the, of your program look like and how can SOMA serve your community? Fantastic, thank you everyone. And we hope you enjoyed getting to chat about your chat in your breakout rooms. Wanting to see if anyone has any share outs that they'd like to, to give back to the group or any reflections.
perfect. Then I know that we are just coming up on time. So I think we'll, we'll skip right ahead. And you can find our contact information here as well as um, feel free to follow up with both with myself, Sada or Stacy. And of course you are welcome to contact our contact at calsoma.org. We have one statewide administrative email and phone number. So this is the, the direct way to get a hold of a person at SOMA. Um, and with that, I will hand it back over to Gabriella. Thanks so much, Kaisa, Stacy, and Sada for such an interactive event at our SIG Forum. Um, I bet everyone enjoyed the breakout rooms. Um, I would like to give a final shout out to our wonderful sponsors one more time and also remind everybody, also next slide, sorry. <laughs> I'm so used to sharing the slides. Remind everybody of our next events. We have webinar six coming out this afternoon. And then tomorrow we have a few other events plus our third week. So be sure to check those out at our website, ecoordinator.info. Lastly, please provide your feedback on the post-session survey that is being posted in the chat for a chance to win a $50 gift card. There is no limit amount of times in which you can provide feedback. And again, thank you everybody for joining and excited to see you at our next event. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank Hope you all.